and Disneyland. California's fastest and growing airline has come to Vancouver. Experience how superb service and discount fares go hand in hand. And growing airline has one one come to Vancouver or Air Cal. We make flying easy. All over the province in this international year of youth, BC Lotteries are helping good things happen. Our Olympic canoe and kayak program wouldn't be nearly as successful without funding from BC Lotteries to keep us on course. To get this new harpsichord, our academy raised funds through concerts and fashion shows, and BC Lotteries played a key role in our success. People with energy and ideas are making our province better, and BC Lotteries are helping. Good morning. You wouldn't know it, but yesterday I pre-taped my show and took the day off and flew to Toronto for a date with a beautiful woman. A beautiful woman who on many occasions is right off the wall. The last time I interviewed her, she humiliated me and embarrassed me in public beyond belief. And now she's written a book about all her previous incarnations. She uh, has spirit guides and all those kind of things and believes in flying saucers. And it is, of course, the Shirley MacLaine. And here's one little question just to tease you that I asked her in Toronto yesterday. That's the question. Will you put a little cloud of light around me to keep me happy and content for the next year? How can light be cloudy, Jack? No, you put a little cloud of light. Well, you said it again. I mean, there are no clouds if there's light. It's perfectly crystal clear. Absolutely. I've been doing that since I met you, since I fell in love with you five years ago, since I spoke about you from the stage. You have been in my conscious mind. Now you're rattling around with me in my super conscious mind. And I am convinced that in one incarnation, you were probably a Roman emperor. Excuse me while I swoon. <laughs> <laughs> She is a riot. We're going to give you the full exclusive Webster interview on Thursday morning. Don't miss it at guess what time, 9 a.m. precisely. Now I've got to get rid of that pleasant visit to Toronto and get back to old clothes and porridge. Quite seriously, the count of botulism, shall I say, victims arising from um, food supply in Vancouver at a white spot has now risen from 13 to 16. And in the studio, to give us the score and the warnings and the details of the detective work involved in this dramatic and very serious story is Dr. John Blatherwick, the medical officer of health for Vancouver. Now, I do have an interview on the program this morning, and I'll tell you quite bluntly, it ain't no Shirley MacLaine, but it's a man with some bright information for us, and he is Robert Laurie, the Australian High Commissioner in Canada. Now, as well this morning, I gotta stay political. This is the day when the Environment and Land Use Committee of the Provincial Cabinet goes up to Sandspit to meet with the Indians at Skidigate or maybe he met with them yesterday, they met with them yesterday, and to meet with some of the others on the benighted question of the South Moresby Park. My position on the Moresby Park is that the vast majority of it must be kept, but this is Lyle Island logging camp. And if Elak does not exclude Lyle Island from the vast Moresby preserve proposed, it will be an economic scandal. It will wipe out millions and millions of dollars for jobs which can perfectly well go ahead in this province if the provincial government and Bennett and Elak and company don't get panicked by those very influential, somewhat, in many ways, airy-fairy environmentalists. Put me down for the jobs on Lyle Island. Don't put me down to wipe them out because of what somebody in Toronto says is visual pollution of logging within a few hundred miles of Mosby. 
We're going to deal with that hopefully this morning. We're going to have time for a free-for-all, but we're going to start with John Blatherwick on the botulism crisis, which is, has spread across the country from Vancouver after the break. <laughs> It is a shock to be told that botulism, often a fatal disease, has broken out in Canada. The man who is looking after this food poisoning crisis is Dr. John Blatherwick, the medical health officer for Vancouver. I believe the number of cases has risen from 13 to 16 over the weekend. Yes, we now have 16 cases in uh, confirmed, what we will now consider confirmed cases and they're spread with three in Montreal, and the three in Montreal are in fairly serious condition. The mother is stable, but the two daughters are not doing very well in the children's hospital there. We have one in Seattle, and he is in good condition. We have another in, in Nanaimo, and she is okay and not in hospital now, as far as I know. We have one in Surrey. We had one last night reported to us in the Royal Columbian Hospital, and again, she is in stable condition. Then we have two in Shaughnessy Hospital. One of those is on a respirator, so He's in worse condition than some of the others. We have one boy in the Children's Hospital. We have three patients in the uh, Vancouver General Hospital, of which one of those is on a respirator. Then we have two in St. Paul's Hospital, both of which are doing fairly well. And then we have one in the Lionsgate Hospital, and she's doing OK. Those who are on respirators then need the assistance to continue to breathe and can be regarded as pretty seriously ill. That's right. If, if Probably if they had not been picked up in time, they would be part of the 50% uh, fatality rate in botulism if undiagnosed and untreated. But how come you're finding cases now when this outbreak was established sometime between August 29 and September 4? Well, the, the basic uh, footwork that had to be done was, was last Monday. We first got, they first suspected that these people had botulism in Montreal but had no confirmation of that. And they notified us on the, on the Wednesday that they suspected it gave us a few restaurants and a few details, but all of it turned out to be false, and we kept coming up against uh, a brick wall. Thursday evening, just before going home, I got a phone call from the provincial lab saying, we think we've got one in Shaughnessy Hospital, and that was our first real clue. When we went to interview the brother, however, we found that the brother was also suffering from botulism, and so we got him in to see his doctor, and he was admitted to hospital. The brother had given a detailed history to, to the family physician of all the foods that he ate and so we now had something solid to go on. We then tracked down the nephew of the family that was in Montreal. They had come through through Vancouver from Hong Kong with the two girls going on to school in Montreal and the nephew gave us a very detailed description of where they ate and we had this late on Friday night. We looked at it and said my gosh the only place they came together was the white spot on uh, Georgia. We then looked at what they ate and they both ate the beef dip. All five of the people who were now our, our first cases had all eaten the beef dip. We contacted White Spot right away, asked them to pull all the beef dip, all the beef products that they were serving, serving the, the roast beef uh, sandwiches and, and the cold sandwiches, which they did immediately. By Saturday morning, we started more of the footwork and more cases started to come in. Vancouver General Hospital cases were notified. And again, the, the first thing, thing that I asked is, get the history. They said, we've already got it. It is the white spot on Georgia. They did eat the, the beef dip. And then the cases started to fall together. The federal government then released a nationwide alert because with the people in Montreal and having been the long weekend that we were dealing with, we had to get uh, people from all across Canada and we also realized we needed it in the United States. So fortunately, the Seattle papers also had the story. Got a phone call from a physician in Seattle said, I said this guy had botulism. Everybody told me he was, I was crazy because there was no, no history that, that he'd eaten any canned foods or salmon or, or anything like this. So uh, he said, said, now I know what I'm dealing with, and cases started to come in. Now where we are at now in the, in, the, in the investigation is that fortunately all of the cases fit between August 29th and September the 4th. Now I'm going to be scared out of my wits if I go beyond September the 4th or even maybe give them one day in September the 5th, but so far it's confined to that period of time. As long as it's in there, what we're picking up now are the milder cases that uh, were affected during this period of time. I have the exact totals for beef dips served between September 1st and September 4th. How many? And it was 95. So that's the, 
the maximum for that period. We have to go back now and get the exact counts for August 29th, which uh, White Spot were giving us yesterday. But 95 is the maximum number of people potentially affected. Uh, an attack rate in that group because 14 of the, of the 16 fall within September 1st to September the 4th. Mm -hmm. So then the detective work has to start. So therefore we're facing a maximum at the moment, if it doesn't include August 29, of 95 potential cases. That's right. Of all 16 of these cases been confirmed by provincial um, examination as botulism? No. The, the three cases in Montreal have had botulism isolated, uh, the botulism toxin isolated from them. Ours, so far, all of our tests are negative. Um, probably we're not going to get any positives out of, the, out of the lab. We got them too late. You have to get them within three to four days of the onset of these things. And their onsets were very mild, not enough to trigger a suspicion of botulism. And it wasn't until they started to get the muscle paralysis that botulism was starting to be suspected. So the provincial lab tells me that they're continuing the testing, but they really don't think But we're you come are up confident with it. and they are confident that they have been these sixteen people, that's the five. Five you say isolated with the toxin. Three isolated. Three. Three with isolated the, with how the toxin. About Seattle, is that isolated with the toxin? No, because uh, it was interesting. They're, they're, um, they didn't take enough serum. I mean you have to take a lot of serum from, from this and and people are, are used to dealing in small amounts. We need 30 cc's of whole clotted blood to do the definitive test. There's six different types of toxins, so you have to do the six different But toxins. the 16 cases have enough of the classic symptoms to be able to say... Th they, are, they are clinically botulism, well, I, no question. I mean, I was always uh, brought up in this country never to eat home canned salmon because of the danger of botulism. Because botulism, a uh, major dose of it will kill you. Right, and in a large enough, it's one of the most terrifying toxins known to man. Um, but in a restaurant, and remember this is a restaurant, I use the term bizarre because we can't find any cases in Canada. Dr. Ernie Bomer, who was the provincial laboratory director for, for a large number of years, 40 years experience, says he can't remember a single outbreak in Canada in a restaurant. We found about three in the literature in the United States. What was it? Do you know yet what caused it? What was the item at the white spot on the beef dip, dip, dip sandwich which caused it? Well, what we're down to now is, is one of three things. The beef is still possible, but we don't think so. The but second beef, that's ordinary beef. Right. Not canned beef. No, it? no, fresh beef, too. Fresh beef. So, so that's probably not what it is. The second is, is we've looked very carefully at the beef dip. It again is a still a possibility and we're checking it out with laboratory tests and that, but we don't think that that's what the it is. The gravy you're talking about. That's right. Mm -hmm. And then finally, the, the thing that, that we are focusing in on is the garlic oil that is used to mix with the butter to give you the garlic butter that is put onto the bun. That seems to be the most likely because, number one, garlic is grown in the ground. Clostridium spores are found in the ground, so you therefore have the scenario where did the clostridium come from? You have a proper pH, you have a time sequence that, that is possible. It was used over a period of days. It's, like, it's not like something that is used today and then thrown out. It's, it's a little jar about this size and they take out a tablespoon of it, mix it up with the butter. So that would also fit with, with it over, over a period but you, of seven you, days. You and your detective work and your assistants from everybody else are now convinced that these 16 cases are botulism that it might well be the garlic, but you don't yet know. No, right now, now we're down to the foot slogging and the waiting. We've done the, the, the dramatic part of it. We've isolated it down. Now it's the foot slogging. More with Dr. John Blatherwick, Medical Health Officer for Vancouver, after the break. With Dr. John Blatherwick, Medical Health Officer for Vancouver. Now, let's get down to botulism again. Precisely what is it? What is it? What symptoms? I don't want to cause panic in the streets, but if somebody's sick at home today, they might want to know what symptoms are. They may have a tiny residual botulism outbreak within them. Right. Basically, it, it's a bacterium called Clostridium botulinum. This uh, lives in the soil, can, is in a lot of things, is generally inactivated by heat. Now, it produces a toxin, and it's a toxin that actually causes the poisoning in man, and it's one of the most ah, vicious toxins that we know, know. What the toxin does is it attacks the acetylcholine uh, production in man. Now, acetylcholine is, is a substance that is used to transmit between the nerve and the muscle. 
So if you've got no acetylcholine, you can't send your nerve signal to your muscle. You get paralyzed. You get paralyzed. And the symptoms, therefore, all fit within this, this not being able to transmit. The first sort of things that people get is they can't swallow. They get double vision because their, their muscle uh, of their eyes won't work properly. They get ptosis of the eye. The eyelids drop. They can't get it open. And they get a tremendous lassitude. The, the one case involved here, he lay down for a, for a nap and he just couldn't get up. The ultimate thing, of course, is it goes on and it par paralyzes the respiratory muscles, and that ultimately leads, leads into death because uh, respiration stop. So those are the sequential symptoms. Now, what we're saying to people is, is the message that we want to first get across is to doctors. If you have been treating somebody for Guillain-Barre, for brainstem tumor, for um, um, myasthenia gravis, if you've been thinking of things like this in patients over the last two weeks, go back and take a look and say, is this a possible botulism? And that has turned up about five of the cases where the doctors have re-examined and said, this may be, be botulism, not what we were looking for. This is because of the unusual, I mean, the, the almost never seen botulism. Give me that again, brainstem tumor, myasthenia gravis, Guillain and what was the first syndrome? one? Guillain-Barre syndrome. If you remember from the swine flu episode, mm -hmm. that was what uh, the people in the United States were coming down with when they got their flu shots. Not in Canada, so because we're getting into the influenza shot season, so I don't want to scare people, but in the United States, Guillain-Barre was part so of the problem. So first you're saying to doctors, if you've got people whom you've been treating for parallel symptoms, go back and check for botulism, even though you won't get a positive test from the provincial lab, likely. Well, the one thing, thing that we still might get, and we want stools from these people, because the, the clostridium spores stay around for a long time, and we're desperately trying to get stools off of all these people. Part of the problem is they're all constipated because their bowels don't work because it's all muscular control, too. So we, we've got this, this problem that, that the things that we want are, are difficult to get difficult to get from them. But uh, obviously if you're suffering from uh, not merely lassitude or the eyelids dropping or double vision, right. but if you're having difficulty breathing, that's got to be the major uh, symptom. Yeah, I think, think the three major things, things that, that people would be worried about is difficulty with swallowing, difficulty with double vision, and then difficulty with breathing. With breathing. And what we think, though, is, is that since it, we are so far staying within the September 4th outside, all of the cases that are going to be found now are going to be mild cases. They are not going to be uh, people who are, are at, at risk. However, in, in truth, we can't rule anything out until the 13th because that was when we got the product off the market so that there is still uh, an outside possibility that I could come up with, with more cases if my September 4th is not the, the final date. So far, September the 4th is the final date for any one of these 16 people. Right. And the first, that's the outside date. What's the inside date? What's the other end of that date? The other end is, is August 29th. So far, all of the cases that, that we have been able to confirm started on August the 29th. And it would probably then, if, if our scenario was right, would fit with the time that the first jar was opened. So you've opened the jar, they, they take out a teaspoon, mix it with the butter, do that a few times during the day in over a period of about seven days because it was a heavy period of time they've used up that jar. Well, it's frightening to learn, as I started off by saying, I, I understood that this botulism was at its most virulent and most dangerous in home canning. Well, almost all the cases that we've dealt with have been that. The last two, two that, that have been dramatic around here was a, an ex episode on the North Shore two years ago where a young boy died after eating uh, salmon that had been purchased and had been improperly cured. The pathologist looked at the symptoms and said, this just might be pot botulism, so he did some tests, and he turned up that it was positive. After They'd, he was dead. After he was dead. But however, that saved another boy's life, because again, he went back and said, hey, is there anybody else in the hospital that's got these kinds of symptoms? And they said, yeah, we don't know what this guy's got. I didn't come and from home canning it. either. That came from badly cured salmon. That's right, and that, that, is, that is another source of it, and that, that's a major source, source is, is uh, fish and, and fish eggs and that. The other one, one that was rather dramatic was the one in, in Surrey that ended up in the Royal Columbian Hospital where the wife opened up a, a can of corn and it smelt so she was going to throw it out but she left it and the husband ate the corn because um, he loved her, her canned corn and he really got a dose and uh, was on a respirator for about three months. So if you can keep them on the catch them early enough and keep them on the respirator long enough, the chances are they'll survive. Is that correct? As long as they don't get the complications that go with being on a respirator. Of course, once you start to intubate a person and, and that, you leave them open to infections, you leave them open to pneumonias and things like that. So that 
they are, they are safe from the symptoms now of, of the botulism. Now they're, they're at the, the risk that will be associated with the treatment. And you're, you're giving this information out to doctors who may be watching or listening, and also to people who may have some sickness of this type in the family. Right, and we're saying to those people, go to your doctor, because the important thing that we want to find out is, do you have any signs? If you've simply had some, some symptoms and they've passed now, well, there's not much we can do. But if you've got still some signs, some weakness uh, of those sorts of things, then we want to hear from the doctors and, and, and see whether or not these are part of our case definition. Your questions now to Dr. Blatherwick. On the topic, please. No panic, but you can ask questions of him uh, after the break. You see, I always thought it had to be canned something, but it's not. You were saying the last major outbreak in the States was what? It was fried onions, which they, of course, had the same sort of feeling that we had. It just can't be this because it's not canned, it's not uh, home-preserved sort of thing. But if that material is in touch with the, the, right, the wrong pH factors and whatever, it can create botulism in any food. That's right. That's what we're starting to realize is that, that the classics, of course, is still, still the way you get it but the unusual does occur. Go ahead from Yaddo. This is Mr. Webster. Uh, can the good doctor possibly tell us what we can do to reduce the elements of uh, botulism in our soils uh, as a uh, produce uh, grower? No, it, it is too widespread a, a bacterium. The spores live in, in the soil, you see, and it's a state that is very resistant to all kinds of things, including uh, heat treatment and that sort of thing. There's nothing that you can do as a grower. Basically, it's the people who process these things that have to take the proper precautions. They have to, if you're doing home cannings, you have to follow the rules right to the T. You've got to cook them at the right temperature for the right period of time, or you're going to be in trouble. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Hi, my question was to do with home canning, and I've always understood that the botulinous or organism was killed at, at 240 degrees Fahrenheit or 10 pounds pressure. Is that not right? Yes, it is for, for the proper period of time. I, I don't have my, uh, my sheets on, on that right now, so I won't try to give it to you off the top of my head, but uh, Agricultural Canada or most of the health units can give you the specifics on, on the length of time that you have to do it. If you do it properly, there is no danger. That's right. If it's done properly, there's no danger. And of course, just from, from the factor that, that we haven't had any outbreak, and this is such a widespread uh, bacterium, uh, we must be generally doing things right. Go ahead, please. Yes, I'd like to know if the toxin is created before canning or during the incubation period after it's canned. It occurs after it's canned. Generally what happens is you have to have anaerobic conditions. In other words, there's no oxygen uh, getting to this, this bacterium. It grows best in this medium and then it produces the toxins. What we're suspecting here is that, that you also get an uneven production of toxins and that's probably why uh, we got a lot of cases, say on September the 2nd, and none so far on September the 3rd, that they, when they scooped out, out the product that, that there wasn't any particular toxin in, in that scoop. But there could have been in other scoops in the that's, same thing. That's after right. After you mix the garlic with the butter. Right. If it wasn't the beef. If it wasn't the beef. Go ahead, please. Yes, Dr. Blatherwick, uh, could you explain to me uh, why the poison seems to affect the respiratory system uh, first and, and not the uh, cardiac muscle? No, it, it affects really the smaller muscles first, and this is why you get the effect on the eyes as, as one of the first signs, the double vision in that. The, the smaller muscles are more susceptible. You then get, get uh, difficulty with the swallowing, again, getting to larger muscles. You then get uh, the, uh, the muscles of the body being tired but, but not go, giving out, and the respiratory muscles are the last muscles to be affected. The heart is a very, very hardy muscle, and uh, long before it gets affected, the respiratory muscles go. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Yeah, uh, I was thinking that um, the, the, uh, the Canadian authorities don't really have the... Uh, it, it seems to me they don't have the qualifications that, uh, that other countries do. And I was wondering, why, why don't you try and bring in uh, other, uh, like, American uh, authorities to investigate this problem? because we're doing a great job. My public health inspectors from the city of Vancouver, Nick Lacido, who did all my footwork for me, Barry Morgan from the federal government, they pinned it down doing footwork. Now, what I have done is I have consulted with the National Botulism Advisory Committee in Canada, 
These are top-notch people in Ottawa, Montreal, here in Vancouver. So yeah, but they don't seem to be coming up with a solution. Oh, I think. To the problem. Are you happy with the progress of your investigation? Well, I'm happy with the progress, and I, I, we have, there's nothing else that we can do at the present time except test the products that we have and wait for those results. Thank we, you. Go ahead, please. I just wanted to know for general interest, uh, are the first signs vomiting, nausea, anything like that? Right. In, in the classic botulism case, within 12 to 36 hours, you get vo vomiting and nausea. In these cases, they didn't. This is probably a toxin B. There are six different types of toxins, which is one of the reasons it's difficult to isolate. You've got to test for all six. B is an unusual one, not the most unusual, but an unusual one, and it did not produce exactly classic symptoms. The, the first sign signs in most of these people seem to be the double vision. Thank you, ma'am. Where am I going? Go ahead, please. Uh, good morning, Dr. Blatherwick. A uh, couple of quick questions. Uh, first, has the original manufacturer of the garlic product in question been contacted? And secondly, do you think the white spot will be held accountable considering its long-standing reputation for unusually high standards? The odds against this sort of thing coming from the white spot would seem phenomenally high. The federal government will probably make a statement about the, the suspected product at this time. As you recognize, we have only put together a scenario. We've not put together any proof, so we're being very cautious. On the second, second one, I have been in contact with Peter Main throughout this entire thing. His position on liability is this. His company is a well-insured company. They have the proper insurance. If, in fact, that becomes the question, the insurance is there. However, at the present time, nobody is worried about liability. We're worried about the patients. Go ahead, please. Hello. Well, I, that's you, yep. Oh, it's me? Yep. Right, they're looking into the food. Uh, should they also be looking into the people that prepared it? In, in 75, I came through uh, Heathrow Airport, London, England, and BOEC food processing plant was closed down because a lady uh, came from India and she, had, uh, she was a typhoid carrier. Hold on, that's a good question. Right. You're looking at the wrong kind of a disease. This disease is not transferred from man to man. It's transferred only through the, the production of the toxin. The toxin cannot be produced from man to man. We looked at, and one of the logical questions that's going to come up, did we look, consider sabotage? And that was one of the things that we considered in the investigation. Could somebody have introduced this, this in because they were mad at the employer or anything like that? Over the period of time, there is no consistency among the, the workers who might have handled the various products. There was no particular reason for, for it and we don't know how you would, you would produce the toxin and, and introduce it. So that's a question that, that will probably come up and, and it's one that we considered and, and have rejected. Go ahead, please. Oh, uh, hello, um, I'd like to ask about uh, uh, my grandson. Um, his mother fed him some uh, uh, fruit cocktail, which at the time when she opened the tin, she thought that it didn't look that good, but then she thought, oh, it must be. So um, the baby after, he ate it within about 20 minutes, got really sick to his uh, stomach. Well, just a minute, when was this? Uh, this, uh, oh, this is about five months ago. Well, is the baby all right now? The, the, the baby is still got condition. Well, I would just suggest you take the baby to the doctor. That's about well, all you can say to that. Well, he's been there several one. times. Yeah. What are you? I, well, I'd like to say something on that because because I think that that brings up a very important thing. If you open a can and you're suspicious, then don't eat it. Don't even consider eating it. Don't feed it to your kid. Don't feed it to your poor old husband. Give it the if cat. If you're at all, no, throw it out. <laughs> throw it out. Um, if, it's, if it's bulging or something like that, send it to the provincial la laboratory for analysis. You should never look at something that you feel is unsafe. If you give anything to a child, of course, the dose relation is, is that much smaller for their body. So right. don't ever take a chance. If a blown can especially, you know how you occasionally see a blown oh, can? Oh, yes. Well, that, that's, the, that's the classic. Mm -hmm. And you never, anything, any swelling, if it's been severely dented, it's one of the reasons manufacturers take those products off the, off the shelves, because with a severe dent, mm -hmm. you could set up the conditions in which anaerobic conditions for, for never the Never buy a system. dented can. Never buy a severely dented can, right. Another section of calls with Dr. Blatherwick after the break. Dr. John Blatherwick on the botulism, the bizarre botulism outbreak in British Columbia and elsewhere. Go ahead, please. 
Yes, uh, I made a batch of dill pickles this summer, and none of them sealed. I seem to have gotten a bad batch of lids. So I poured off all of the liquid and reheated it, and when I poured it back in, all of the garlic cloves turned a shade of blue. And now I'm, I'm kind of leery of eating them. Well, I would be too. Um, again, I think, think it's a standard rule. If you've got a problem with it, don't take the chance. I mean, the, the potential for producing this toxin is, is not that great. I mean, we don't get that many cases. But because untreated, it can be lethal, it's just not worthwhile taking that chance. Thank you, so ma'am. Go I ahead, would. please. Throw them out. Go ahead, please. Hello. Um, I'd like to ask a few questions. And the first one is, um, uh, is there any other way to detect um, the botulism other than the swelling up of the can? No, in some cases, though, though, when you open a can, it smells. This is one of the other things, things why we're, we're suspicious of the garlic oil, is that there's enough of a smell from the garlic to mask the, the uh, clostridium smell, so that that may be, be why it was able to sneak through. You can smell botulism. In some cases. Again, there's six different types, and, and some of them, apparently, you can smell. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. What Go ahead. About Go ahead, ma'am. What about putting uh, tomatoes in the freezer? In the freezing process, does that kill botulism? Yes, uh, the, the clostridium is, is killed at uh, very low uh, levels. If it's not killed, however, it, the conditions are such that it cannot produce the toxin. So that if it's frozen and then eaten right after it's come out of the freezing, then it's, you know, after it's warmed up. But, but as long as there's not a long period of time for it to be incubating. Thank you. You could start a cooking show, couldn't you? Yes. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Oh, it, uh, hello, doctor. Yes. Uh, if you open up some uh, uh, home-cooked canned salmon or beef and boil it first, will that kill the botulism? Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to guess at that, that one. Uh, if you're going to do that, that again, and go back. If you're suspicious, don't eat it. Go ahead, please. Hello? Yep. Um, I'd like to ask Doctor, has there been any other cases recorded from any other white spots in the lower mainland? Absolutely none. There are no other white spots implicated in this whatsoever. We have been through the white spot commissary because this is a large chain. They claim that they feed at least one in four people in the lower mainland in a week. They have this large commissary. That's where we started because we were afraid what if it happens if it's widespread. Nothing in there. We've been to the restaurant. We've been through their processes there. It's nothing to do with the way things are being handled in there. And so you do not have to be afraid of others. However, White Spot has pulled all of the beef products. You cannot get a beef dip in any White Spot restaurant. You will not get, get the uh, juice and you will not get, get the uh, uh, garlic butter in any of the White Spots because they just pulled everything. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I presume they'll bring it back one day. Oh, yes, uh, I would hope that, that after a period of time, time we can clear the, the substances. Uh, it's a widespread item that's used by a lot of people. Uh, a lot of people. people, a lot of restaurants. That's right. Go ahead, please. Dr. Blatherwick, I think your team is doing an excellent job, but I'd like to know if it is a known fact that cans that are severely dented uh, could possibly contain this toxin. Why are they allowed to be sold in supermarkets and grocery stores? They're often marked down at wholesale prices, which is off, you know, it's tempting for the person that wants to save some money to buy it. We insist that those be taken off the shelves. A severely dented can is not supposed to be sold, and where my inspectors or the federal inspectors uh, find it, they take it off the shelves. Most of the big, big stores, the good chains, do not sell dented products. Fair enough, thank you. Go ahead, please. Yes, good morning, sir. Um, I'm calling with reference to a clip I saw on the news and feeding infants uh, honey or corn syrup as a sweetener to add to their food. And I'm sure there's millions of mothers out there that have been doing so for, uh, since birth. And I just would like to hear your response on that and the uh, botulism that is contained in it and the child's ability to deal with it. Thanks. That That is a great question. I'm really glad that came up because there is now well known a baby botulism and that is the mechanism, just as you have described it. People dipping the uh, soother into the honey and giving it to the baby, and apparently the medium is correct in, in that sort of a circumstances for the clostridium to be in the uh, uh, honey and the child. Uh, we've had cases of, of infant uh, botulism, very often missed and, and resulting in death. So uh, that, 
was uh, in Canada, oh yes, in a well-known... Don't thing. dip the soother in honey. Right. Very, very bad, and my dentist friends would just love me to say, say it's what even else? worse. What else? What else? No, that, that was the major mechanism for, for that sort of a, an event. It was, it was the honey that, that uh, was the It wasn't dirt on the soother. It could have been. I mean, that may have been the way it was introduced in the honey. Then the honey was a good medium. In other words, I'm not saying that, that the honey necessarily had it, but somehow or other it got in it. Again, these spores are around all over the place. The kid on the carpet, his, on the hands, everywhere. Potentially. So the kid drags a soother, and if you've ever watched a kid with a soother, they do everything with it. Um, so don't dip the soother in honey. Absolutely not. Baby botulism, just as fatal as adult botulism. And probably, that's recognized. Probably, probably more, more so. so because of the small size of the baby. You know, well, the, dented, the dented tin, tins thing, thing, too, is an interesting one because that is one of the problems that you wrestle with in public health. How much of a dent can you let them have before you let them sell it? And we've had meetings, and, and they're hilarious, trying to describe how much a tin can be dented before you buy it. I would not personally buy a dented tin in any circumstances. I would buy one with a little dent in the car, and I wouldn't bother me. I wouldn't. Well, I won't do it again. I won't dip the soother in honey. Good. <laughs> hey, great stuff, Dr. Blatherwick. Quite a detective job you and your team are doing. Sixteen now. There 16 could be cases. more. There could be another 70 of them. Right. There shouldn't be any more serious cases. We, we should have gone over the mark. What we should only be looking for is mild cases now. And I think the medical profession know what we're looking for. The word has gone out. I have medical teams at all the major hospitals. They are going through the records of the emergency departments. They are going through the wards, and particularly the neurology wards. We're getting magnificent cooperation from all the emergency room physicians, the administrators of the hospitals. So if it's around, we're going to find it. The only other thing is beyond here, if people traveled, and this show I know goes out in the Okanagan and such, mm -hmm. if there's doctors or people out there who traveled through Vancouver, ate at, a white, at that particular white spot during that time, have a problem, I'd like them to get into their, their doctors too. My thanks to John Blatherwick. Mighty good show. Next we're going to speak to the Australian High Commissioner, the Honourable Robert S. Laurie, after the break. Robert Laurie, Rob Laurie, is that correct, sir? That's is correct. the High Commissioner for Australia. And I have a very simple question to put to him after I've established his bona fides. You're a professional diplomat. That's correct. Career diplomat. Career diplomat. Been all over the bleeding world. All over the world. And now here you are in Ottawa, the, cli the capital of the worst climate of any capital of any nation on the face of the earth. I think you're pretty cruel on that. I haven't experienced your winter yet, but summer's been beautiful. Uh, and having had three winters in Moscow, I really don't think it's going to be all that hard to take. The winters in Moscow are like uh, pleasant days in Honolulu compared to a bad day in Ottawa. Well, I've got something, a treat in store. I you certainly have. Now, what can you do to help us? Where are we as a nation failing in trade with Australia? Because as you well know, much of our export resource trading has gone to hell in a handbasket. Are we missing any markets in Australia that we could be feeding and competing in? I think that's a good question. So far, uh, your trade figures are rather more impressive than ours. You're exporting twice as much to us as we are to you. But I think there's ground for uh, improvement on both sides. And one of the things that will be happening very soon is that your Minister for External Trade, Mr Kelleher, will be leading a group of businessmen to Australia in uh, November. And the, the theme of that will be looking at areas of improving industrial cooperation. We hope as a result of this that bilateral trade will improve and also we'll look at ex opportunities for um, joint uh, operations in third markets. And this is something we need to look at. Joint ventures in Southeast Asia. That is one of the things that we'll be examining. You this see, people keep telling us about <coughs> the wonderful, glorious opportunities in the Pacific Rim, but it doesn't seem to translate yet to jobs that help us very much in Western Canada. I think one of the questions there is the sort of products that are coming out of Western Canada as uh, uh, to the Pacific Rim, as is the case in Australia. We compete, as you rightly said, in matters like uh, sales of coal or of wheat, and our markets in the Pacific Rim are not limitless. Uh, we have to look at another mix of products for that market. And I think one of the exciting prospects that both our countries should explore is whether we can be complementary in some of our production 
and targeting it on markets in that region uh, with a view to expanding our, our trade levels. How come we've got a balance, a favourable balance of trade with you? What do we ship to you that gives us that $700 million balance in our favour? You've got a mixture of goods that you sell to us. Agricultural equipment, sulphur, um, a range of manufacturers. Indeed, Australia is about the fourth largest market for your manufactured exports. Yeah, but in coal you compete with us very strongly, don't ah, you? Indeed, we're and not you're selling also coal competing with Korea. Indeed, uh, but we're not selling coal to each other. We're no. competing on third markets with our coal sales. Well, now, uh, what about the economic conditions inside Australia? You've got a Labour government again, as I recall, Hawks as the Prime Minister. Correct. We had the Gough Whitlam in here the other day, and he was very good indeed. Do you have an anti-American policy, or was that just what Gough Whitlam was telling me about what he feels the Americans are doing with UNESCO? I don't think we have an anti-American policy at all. After all, we have an alliance with uh, the United States. Uh, it's called ANZUS. Uh, Gough Whitlam, I think, was concerned about a particular aspect in an international organization called UNESCO. Correct. Out of which the United States uh, went fairly recently because it felt that reform was necessary and it had to bring pressure to bear. Australia doesn't look at it this way, and I won't rehearse what no. Whitlam said. No. But we don't have an anti-American policy as such. There are issues in which we have differences of views, but we are in an alliance with it's the It's the United New States. Zealanders that have the raw spots with the Americans at the moment, isn't it? There are some problems there indeed, Jack. That's quite and right. And with the French. That is really a very serious problem, and we regard President Mitterrand's visit uh, to uh, Muro Atoll very recently as a provocation. Two reasons for that. One is that uh, members of the Pacific Forum countries recently uh, agreed to form a nuclear weapons-free zone. One of the aspects of that was to avoid nuclear tests. Within weeks of that, President Mitterrand visits the site where the tests are on and then invites forum countries to come and visit it. Our view is quite simple. If the French tests are that safe, take them back and test them in France. Yeah, because other testing has been stopped in the Pacific. That's quite correct. Since the early post-war days with the Americans and the various atolls. Quite correct. Of course, that's all been coloured and embarrassed very much by the involvement of, it would seem, of the French Secret Service in the, the killing of the man and the blowing up of the Rainbow Warrior. That matter's under sub judice but I've read the press reports on it, and it's and obviously a matter of great concern to the New Zealand government and to other governments. Now, um, our Prime Minister... Straighten your face, Webster. Our Prime Minister appears to be having, going to have a meeting with the Americans on free air trade with the United States. Mm. Are you on the same gambit with the Americans, or do you, are you happy with your GATT agreements and your present agreements with the Americans? We're not in a similar situation to you geographically or in terms of the level of our trade uh, export percentages to the United States. <coughs> We're not uh, next door to the United States. We have uh, a strong trading relationship with the United uh, States and our interest essentially is on multilateral trade and the tra liberalisation of trade. Uh, of course it's for Canada to judge its best interests and uh, uh, there seems to be a move nationwide for uh, bilateral negotiations. I'm not sure whether these will focus on free trade and what does free trade mean? There are so many definitions of free or freer trade. Yeah, we're all hanged with GATT anyway, aren't we? Uh, GATT is the prime focus of your trading policy and ours. One uh, couple of trivia questions. Rate of unemployment in Australia? 8.7%. Uh, Nationally? Nationally. Just like Ontario but not like British Columbia. So you're not suffering. Have you gone through a major recession such as we've gone through on the West Coast? We did go through a very significant uh, recession in the early 80s, but uh, in the last couple of years, uh, our growth rate has been quite surprising, and indeed it's up to about 5% on OECD projections at the moment. Great stuff. Well, I just met Rob Laurie, the new, reasonably new Australian High Commissioner who is based in Ottawa. Best of luck, sir. For God's sake, try and sell something for us. We're not doing so well ourselves these days. I'd like to do that, but I'd also uh, like to ask you folks to sell something for us. Thank you very much. Next to Free For All, after the break. Because I was out of town in Toronto over the weekend, I'm convinced this is Monday and not Tuesday. It is Tuesday, isn't it? Definitely Tuesday. It's going to be a funny week this week when you're out of town. And the reason I was out of town was to go down and do a, an interview with Shirley MacLaine about a, a new book, which is... You know, if anybody else had written that book, 
It's called, uh, what's it called? Dancing in, Dancing in the Light. And over the years, I've interviewed all kinds of weirdos. You know, flying saucer weirdos, metaphysic weirdos, uh, reincarnation weirdos. And as a matter of general principle, I've stopped interviewing people like that. But when it's somebody with the charm and charisma of Shirley MacLaine, she manages to make some quite extraordinary sense from her point of view out of it. And I just want to tell you that we can't, we won't have it edited and ready to go until Thursday morning at 9 o'clock, but I want you to be sure to watch it. Very good indeed. Now, Lyle Island. I will not give up on whatever pressure I can exert on the Environment and Land Use Committee of the provincial government to exclude Lyle Island from the South Moresby Park Preserve for a very simple reason. It is in the process of being logged, has been logged since 1958. The license renewed in 1979, I think it was, and established, they established logging operation with good markets for the milling of its woods on the lower mainland. And to me, it is incomprehensible when our economy is the present state that any government would not continue to issue cutting permits and, in addition, exclude Lyle Island from Moresby. I am amazed by the lack of common sense which is apparently floating around uh, the environmentalists. I'm all for the park. God, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of square miles of the park. But I'll never forget what that woman, Colleen McCrory, said to me the other day about their million petition to save all of Moresby, including Lyle Island. She said, a million people can't be wrong. Well, I get news for her. They're wrong. Lyle Island, in all common sense, must be excluded from the park, especially a social credit government. And then, of course, when I had Bob, I've got some nasty mail this week from people who think I was rude and rough with Bob Skelly, leader of the NDP. I was not. If Mr. Bennett were to appear, and it's very difficult to get Mr. Bennett to appear, and I'm not about to plead and crawl on my hands and knees for such an interview, but if he were to appear, the first thing I would say to him would be, in the name of all that's common sensible, how can you include Lyle Island in Moresby Park? I'm sure half the department officials, although I haven't spoken to them, agree with my view. It's jobs. It's already a log. It's stupid to do otherwise. In today's, in the good old halcyon days, you know, when we could sell every piece of milled lumber and everybody was getting wage increases and there was no unemployment, do we like? It's different today. Am I taking phone calls? Am I taking phone calls? Yes, let's have some phone calls, please. Go ahead, please. Yes, Jack, good morning to you. Morning. Uh, first, I, I have to just go along with you there. Sometimes the masses don't really get the right amount of information, so they make the wrong judgment. And in retrospect to that, I wanted to bring up two subjects. One was the BC lottery and the lack of funds for education. Where's the money going? Why is it going into abstract forms of, of glorification for Bennett and his government? And secondly, your interview with Shirley MacLaine, um, she's going to bring up the, the issue of UFOs. And I've had the privilege of talking to you about this on a couple of occasions. And you, you um, I think, would have a better opinion or a more, uh, a better overview if you took a little closer look at the subject matter about extraterrestrial. Listen, I love Shirley MacLaine dearly. Let's make that quite plain. I have, I am one of the living interview experts on UFOs. I have interviewed every nut in the world about it. We're, on, we're not all nuts. <laughs> you're acting like the uh, the Church of Rome with Galileo when you say we're all nuts, and you're just, you know, you're just, I think, uh, cutting yourself off when you generalize like that, and you're cutting off the open-mindedness of, of your viewers. You've got a very strong vehicle, uh, and with that, I think you should be a little guarded about some of your generalizations when it comes to extraterrestrial intelligence. Well, like no, I'm, anything's possible, but metaphysical double-talk normally doesn't intrigue me at all. 
you know. And every time you meet somebody who's been in a flying saucer, and I've met all kinds of people who've been beamed up in lights. I've spoken to Monkwa from Mars. I've been with people who've circled the Earth in 20 minutes. And I know all about the regrowing of arms and Venus and all the rest of it. And I know you can do eyes and toads and on this Earth. It's just as a little matter of a lack of proof. Any kind of proof. Any kind of proof at all. But I love people who love flying saucers. Now, go away. Go ahead from Prince George. Hello. Uh, I just wanted to make a comment on the subject of botulism. Yes, ma'am. Um, I was told by Agricultural Canada that the combination of fish and vegetables found in antipasta cannot be properly processed even using a pressure canner, that they recommend freezing and only for a three-month period. And I know so many people don't realize this. Uh, I, I just wanted to let I'm you know. glad. I've always been suspicious of antipasta. Always been suspicious of it. Yeah, and what do you do when you get it for a gift for Christmas? <laughs> That's, Give it the chickens. Yeah. Give it the chickens. That's our best idea. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Castle guy. I'm not in insulting anybody whose ethnic food is antipasto. I just don't happen to like antipasto. I don't like Auntie Mary either, but antipasto is something <laughs> I don't enjoy. Go ahead from Castle guy. Uh, Jack, I'm a great grandmother. I've come across the, some botulism in my days. Uh, wax beans seemed to be the villain many years ago in home canning. And we were warned against botulism. And yet I canned hundreds of jars of them. Oh, the answer is quite simple, ma'am. If they're properly canned at the proper pressure for the proper time at the proper heat, there can't be no botulism in it. A lot like the polio. The young ones were the victims years ago, and there's been a rumor that polio has a recurrence in some of the older ones who were supposed to have been immune. Well, I, I don't want to get into that. Oh, I know you don't. We'll take the warning on the wax beans. I'm inclined to believe you on wax beans. And we'll take a break, too, now. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Hello, Mr. Webster. Morning, sir. Uh, this Lyle Island, now, what's the matter with these uh, politicians that they can't seem to uh, realize that the people need jobs more than they need parks right they, now? We can't afford to put up more parks. And... They got no guts. That's the trouble with the politicians. They've just got no guts. Well, why, the thing is, we, we're, we're, the public here, we sit back and we realize what has to be done. It's the same as the death penalty. It should be brought in. We need some deterrent for the public today. It's, there's crime that's going on that we just can't keep up with. Well, I'm not going to equate it, but there could be 85 men working at Lyle Island with another three or 400 men, or a men and women. And that, instead, we're down to 33. And if they don't get the cutting permits soon, Lyle Island will close right now and all these jobs will be lost too on the lower mainland and in Sandspit and everywhere. And this talk about a vast tourism industry for the Charlottes is talk. The climate is abysmal except for 90 days of the year. The winds are incredible. It's a beautiful remote area which we must preserve for our cultural and environmental heritage, but there's no bleeding need not to log Lyle Island. Well, I can't understand why they can't ask these forestry people that they have hired to uh, 
The to do their job people, the instead forest, of them turning around, sitting back and guessing at it. The forestry people are perfectly prepared, I'm sure, to recommend the continued logging on the existing TFL of Lyle Island. It's politicians like, uh, like Pelton and Bennett and Waterland and the whole social credit kerfuffle that just will wilt at the sign of a protest from important people. That's all it is. Watch what you say, Webster, because you mean most of what you say. Go ahead, please. Hello. Hello? Yeah. Yeah, Jack, I work in the Queen Charlotte Islands in the logging camp. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't know how many people have actually tried to take a hike up there, but you're going to be up to your knees in the muskeg before you get three feet off the world. And it's not possible to transfer the loggers to Sewell Camp. Once you take away to Sewell, once you take away Lyle, you reduce the liable cut and fewer people are employed. Well, there's already a bird sanctuary at Sewell Inlet. Mm -hmm. And the, you can't just up and pick up a logging camp and move it anywhere. No, I know. And, you know, how many people can actually have access to this park? About a thousand a year. That's right. How Maximum. many people work there? It cost you four. It cost you two thousand dollars for a day trip by helicopter to the proposed Windy Bay Ecological Reserve, where the muddlets, uh, muddlets, uh, these you know strange seabirds. Two thousand dollars for a day trip it cost you thirteen hundred dollars per person per week to go on a yacht through Moresby. That's right. There is people? no tourism for the ordinary person. We we want all the tourism up the Queen Charlotte's we can get, but we can only handle so many people. The climate's against it. Oh, the climate is always... You said 90 days. Mm. You, we're, we're lucky if we get three weeks sunshine up there a year. I know. I was lucky the time I was up recently in that we had perfect Hawaiian-type weather. Yeah, you hit her lucky there. We had a nice about three weeks of summer this year. I don't know. I don't know what the people in Sandspit think about this government, but I know what they should think about it. Well, I know what most of the loggers I talk to think about it. And even the people in the tourist industry agree that there is more income comes from Lyle Island being logged than they'll ever make out of making it a park. And when you go down to Kumshawa Inlet, you find a lot of ordinary people who are able to take their mobile homes, their trailers with them, to Kumshawa Inlet. Mm -hmm. Once you preserve everything else, ordinary people can't go. Yeah, and if, if there are no up, logging yeah. roads, there's no place to go. No, there's only one road on the entire island that you can drive on. Finishes it? Does it finish at Talal or Kumshawa Inlet? Uh, it runs from Skidigat up to Masset. Oh, I'm talking, not talking about the North Island. You can go from Skidigat to Masset and Port Clements, can't you? Yeah. Okay, dokie, much obliged. I'm glad you're with me. Nice to take a position for a change instead of weaseling. Go ahead, please. Hi, Jack. Hi. How are you this morning? Not bad. Well, listen, about Lyle Island, you know, like your argument makes a lot of sense, but I, but I have to be a fence sitter, and uh, that uh, kind of depends on one question that you really didn't ask Bob Skelly. You seem to be really uh, hopped up on, it has to be Lyle Island. I mean, are you interested in the jobs, or are you interested in Lyle Island? First question. I'm interested in the, the position on the ground on Lyle Island and the jobs on Lyle Island and the spin-off jobs on Lyle Island and I'm totally against the snotty attitude that all logging must be stopped on Lyle Island because if you're hiking on a mountain 50 miles away, you could see a little piece of logging slash, and that's visual pollution. You ever uh, hear such Jack, I've traveled the island uh, very well, so I know, I know exactly what it would look like. I'm really not against the logging. What I am against is, is the fact that, you know, uh, Hydro today announced another 50 layoffs. There was 18 last week. 300 and some odd jobs were lost at a mill closing in Vancouver the other day. The government hasn't addressed those issues, nor will it. So why do you expect it's going to do something so uh, sane as to provide jobs for 90 people? But this is a concrete case where the jobs are there, the licenses are there, the market is there, and even Bennett can see there are jobs there. Well, Jack, I put mean, in my as... word for him. I mean, the man's a fool, and I think he's just proving it every day. Thank you. Just a minute before you go. You saw the show we did on the economy yesterday, didn't you? Yes, I did. And you saw Peter Bentley of Canfar admitting very frankly and bluntly how bad things are in Canfar. No and question. How, and how they've had to divest themselves of their other interests, like the trust company. 
and whatnot and whatnot and whatnot. And when Peter Bentley sits there and tells you things are bad and going to get worse, surely even Bennett would say, let's save the jobs on Lyle Island. Jack, I agree, but the fact is that it is Peter Bentley and it's people like him who, who put Bennett where he is and who's keeping him there. So in effect, you know, they've got no right to come bitching to you. They should just go right to Bennett and say, look at man, what are you doing? There's people like you that put Bennett there, too, don't forget. I didn't vote for him, Jack, but I have to agree with you. The labor, the labor in this province are the people who put Bennett where he is. And so if he's, and after if he's putting it down their throat now, they deserve every little bit of it. And after Bob Skelly's lack of sympathy for the Lyle Island loggers the other day, I wonder what the people in the NDP think of him. Well, you know, Jack, uh, the people of the NDP are like people anywhere else. You're going to have some people agree, some people disagree, and you're going to have fence-sitters. You know, the fact of the matter is, is that we have an incompetent government here and everybody's screaming from every which way. But the fact is, is that through the glitzy expo and all the rest of this, uh, the, the public money for private use, you know, of some people, the fact is they're going to get them back in. You know, I, you see yeah. the ads on television where, you know, like... Uh, oh, I know, everything's wonderful. We've opened a new factory. We've been seeing the same commercial for years now. I know what you're talking about and I like your description of glitzy expo. Jack... I'm a good British Columbian, even though he called me a bad one. I'm a good one, and I'm going to stay loyal to BC, not to him. That's why I'll support Expo. But I don't support its shoddy management, especially Jimmy Patterson. I had a lot more respect for him than I do now. Thank you. I can't say any more. Thank you very much. Oh, I don't think you can blame Jimmy for all of it, but I myself do express my considerable unhappiness about the way Expo has been run in what I regard as a public crown corporation. Now, what else? Feels like Monday morning still. It's Tuesday. You get that camera up a bit, please. Up a bit. Not all the way up. I'll take Stop. Right, there. Let's have a look at me. That's fine. Where are we? Go ahead, please. Uh, Jack, you had that lady environmentalist on the other day, and I, I, a couple of things that she said talking about a marine park in the Queen Charlotte. Uh, I'm an ex-commercial -fi fisherman, and I don't know how many of the people that signed that petition have ever crossed Hecate Straits um, in any form of uh, a boat. I've been on a fairly large seine boat. It is one of the most vicious, unforgiving sections of the country. And uh, to hear somebody like that lady talking about a beautiful marine park where millions of visitors are going to attend, it's absolutely ludicrous. It's garbage. And the other thing that really frightens me, Jack, is listening to Skelly talk the other day. He sounds like the Green Party. The Indian land claims, according to Jack Monroe, are going to account for some 75% of the province. If these environmentalists get their way, what is there going to be left along? Stanley Park is going to start to look pretty good. Well, you see, once we, if we put this park in, and once we buy back from Western Forest Products and compensate them for their TFL holdings, and then the courts give the land to the Hyders, we'll then have to buy the land from the Hyders. It's just impossible. The whole thing is so... I mean, 70% of the coastal forest lands, I am told, are under potential Indian land claim. That's Bennett's fault. Ten years ago, negotiations could have been achieved and finished with the Indians on their land claims in British Columbia. The only one that went to court with the treaty base and was very successful, of course, was the Nishka. And then there were some settlements down here on the McBride Cutoffs in West Vancouver. But there are all kinds of fabulous claims being made. Well, as I said, Jack, I, I wish that those million people that signed the petition had the opportunity to cross Hecate Straits in a good southeaster, and you'll probably see them taking their names off the uh, off their petition. Well, I've been on a halibut boat too once, and I wouldn't go on a halibut boat again for a thousand dollars cash bonus a day. Well, that's right. They, the people don't realize that area, and the availability to the average person, as you've indicated, Jack, is unbelievable. It's it's just garbage. Garbage to talk about it as a great tourist area. Uh, go ahead, please. Hello. Have I got the wrong thing? I can't read these numbers here. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Jack. Yeah. Good morning. Yeah, I've worked up Lyle and I've been off work. How long? Turn down your television set. Hold on, I'll use you after the break. Take a break.
A couple of calls. Go ahead, please. Uh, good morning, Jack. Morning. I, I one of the workers who has been laid off up there. I'm a father. I've been off for two and a half months, and my other partner, he's been off since January, or December, pardon me. You'd have fallen at Lyle Island for the and logging. That's right. I've been up there for three years, falling. What do you think about the fact that they'll probably, they're not issuing cutting permits and will probably put it in the reserve? I think it's pretty stupid, Jack, very stupid, because it's sure no place for a park. I mean, I've worked there for three years, and I know the, what the weather's like. So what are your chances of getting a job falling anywhere else in B.C. at the moment? It's fairly slim, Jack. How old are you? 52. 52? Yes, sir. Well, you can thank Premier Bennett if it happens, or you can thank Waterland, or you can thank Pelton for not issuing the cutting permits, or you could still be working up there right now. Yes, I could be. In fact, I'm going back tomorrow for just a short period, though. I've got some blow down the fall to cut, I mean, the fall in the You're going to clear some of that blow down. Yes. O okay, all the very best, and thanks for your support in my little campaign. Okay, Much thanks. obliged. Bye. Go ahead, please. Hello, Jack. Yeah. I'm phoning with regards to two points, one to do with Lyle Island and uh, what the environmentalists, if they win, will do to what we call the Pacific Accord. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with it. It's been in jurisdiction for the last 14 years, or at least the wrangles of it. Which? Uh, the point I'd like to make, though, is that uh, the Geographical Survey of Canada estimates that the seabed between the north tip of Vancouver Island and the Alaska Maritime Boundary holds between 500 million to 1.1 billion cubic meters of oil and over 400 billion uh, cu cubic meters of gas. Uh, you were talking about a secondary industry. There's an awful lot of opportunity in the oil industry off of there, and if you allow the envi environmentalists to turn around and uh, close off Lyle Island, where are they going to go next? 150 miles offshore, 200 miles offshore, are they going to shut down the oil rigs uh, potential of growing in the next five years in the West Coast? That's my point. Good point. Well taken. No, I think the environmentalists who want everybody to be on welfare, but God knows where the money will come from. Right. Much obliged. Now, I've got to take a couple of minutes with Jack Millage, Mill Edge, from, that's you, isn't it? That's right. From Shuswap Rotary Club. What the hell are you doing here, Jack? Well, we're uh, helping the CPR celebrate the driving of the last bike. Yeah. Helping the CPR? <laughs> Nobody on this program helps in CPR. <laughs> Big Julie was only on the program once, that and right? that was after they left the CPR. Well, we're, we're honoring the CPR pioneers. When, that's better, yeah. that's better. When and where? At Kregalaki, November the 7th, 1885. They drove the last spike. Kregalaki. At Kregalaki. Who was the old boy that drove the spike? Donald Smith. Donald Alexander Smith. Right. What time of day did he drive the last spike? 9.22 in the morning, on a misty morning. What time of day, are you going to do it all over again on November the 7th this year? Yeah, they're going to do it. They're reacting that, uh, that driving of the last spike every day, as a matter of fact. But the CPR are having another misty morning, probably. Who's somewhere. going to drive the last spike this time? I don't really know. It's not you? No, it's not me. What are these coins you want to flog to <laughs> all the hordes of people that do what Webster tells them? Well, the, the, the uh, Shushwap Rotary Club, in conjunction with High Country Tourism, have minted uh, a centennial coin, and uh, that's a collector's set. One of w There will only be a hundred of those minted, and uh, they're on sale from a dollar coin mm -hmm. to a silver coin for $40. And the collector set is eight hundred and fifty dollars. Gotta be joking. No. Okay. Twenty-four karat gold. The, and who is producing these? The Shuswap Rotary Club. Yes. At the Mint yes. in Ottawa. No, share at Mint in Alberta. In Alberta, and you're going to make money for the Rotary Club's good activities. We're hoping to. Okay. The last spike silver coin is worth how much? Forty, 40 bucks. Forty dollars. Now this. Uh, set of the last spike centennial coin set, a hundred sets only. It will have a gold one, a silver one, and two silver ones. No, a silver one and an uncirculated nickel bonded steel. That's the same as this this coin. And how much will that cost? The set? Yeah. The set is eight hundred and fifty dollars. How many have you sold up to now? Ten of them. Eight hundred and fifty dollars. Are they worth it? Oh yes. 
No be, kidding. They'll be worth considerably more once uh, that 100 is 24, all gone. That's 24 karat gold then, That's isn't it? right, yeah, 24 karat gold. It's in plastic though, my grubby little hands can't. It's, it's untouched as of human hands. Untouched by human hands. Yeah. What do you need all this money for? That's uh, $8,000. You use for it for a, the... For a hundred sets? Oh, no, it's $80,000. 85000 85000 Right. No, you just said... Well, the cost of them is high. Yeah. But the proceeds go to uh, rotary projects. Where are you selling them? Well, everywhere. Uh, Will you find the Rotarian? Across, yes, we've got... Uh, we've sold them throughout uh, Canada and the United States. We've had orders now from, from uh, right across Canada and in uh, a lot of parts of the United States. And if you want to buy one, you get in touch with the Shuswap Rotary Club, Centennial Coins, Box 2018, Salmon Arm, B.C. That's right. Oh, yes, the finger town. <laughs> hey. We were trying to eliminate that. Well, too. we'll forget all about it. We'll <laughs> call it Shuswap Rotary. Not bad. And where are you selling the dollar coins? Uh, throughout a lot of the retail outlets, uh, uh, from Kamloops to Golden and into Banff, uh, Calgary. So watch for the Shoe Swap Rotary, uh, Shoe Swap Rotary, last spike commemorative, commemorative coins issued for the 1985 Railway Centennial. And you're Jack Millage, and you live in Salmon Arm. I live in Salmon Arm. Always have done. No, I've been there since 1978. What do you do for a living? You retired. No, I'm a fishing guide. Fishing guide. Right. You ain't got no 34 and a half pound spring salmon. <laughs> you won't see me up catching any of you. <laughs> Come and catch a, fight, a fighting rainbow. Chintzy little rainbow trout of a mere 25 or 30 pounds. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> Thanks very much, Jack. It's a pleasure, Jack. Just wanted to give you a plug for your good cause. Oh, and I shall be back. I pray the break. Don't miss Shirley MacLean Thursday morning. Thursday morning at 9 o'clock. Tomorrow I ain't got no Shirley. I got three MPs, a Tory, a Liberal, and an NDP. -er. Oh, Sven's coming back. Oh, good. And Sheila Finestone and Patrick Boyer. Uh, might be quite good. It's worth joining me anyway. And don't forget Shirley on Thursday. I'll see you tomorrow, 9 a.m. precisely. <laughs> A trio of MPs on equal rights. Tomorrow, 9 a.m. precisely. Worried about equal rights between men and women? Watch me tomorrow with the trio of MPs. No good. Trio. Worried about your equal rights? I'm going to test them tomorrow with a trio of MPs, including Sven, of course, at 9 a.m. precisely.